So you are sitting on a houseboat in um, Mission Creek. It has actually had a million different names. Um, it is a creek that originally started at Mission Dolores. They would never put a mission not near a water source. So there is a small creek that runs out of the back of Mission Dolores. It crawled through um, the mission. There's actually still a remnants of it on 17th and I think Valencia or no. Folsom, there's, there's one piece that comes out of the water. And then from there, it opened into this huge bay, which is why, like, when it rains a lot, you see them putting sandbags out near... Folsom um, and 17th. Yeah, Folsom and 17th near the right spot. It's like mm -hmm. all that is like old lake bed. That was San Francisco houseboat resident Sarah Davis. I'm Jeff, and this is Storied San Francisco. Every week on this podcast... You'll hear from chefs, bartenders, journalists, and other San Franciscans telling stories and responding to the question, what is it about this place? Welcome to Season 2, Episode 15, Part 1. Sarah's parents split up when she was young. Her dad eventually decided to live on a houseboat on Mission Creek and brought Sarah and her young brother along with him part-time. In this podcast, Sarah talks about that first houseboat she lived on, some of the eclectic characters that made up the houseboat community back then, and the interesting lives her parents lived. Here's Sarah. It's Mission Bay. Right. Um, there was two creeks. There's Islas Creek, that is sort of the Army Street Cesar Chavez, mm -hmm. and then there's uh, Mission Creek that ran into Mission Bay. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting on a houseboat in Mission Bay. My name is Sarah Davis. I'm 47 or 46 years old. Okay. <laughs> Depending on the tide. <laughs> I just, I, I get it wrong every time. Okay. Um, and then, um, and so I have lived here. We moved here when I was seven, so about 40 years. Wow. And when we first came down here, it was abandoned train yards. And it was this sort of hodgepodge of funny boats. Um, and so I'll sort of, I'll, let me take you sort of like how we got there. Okay, please. Okay, so my parents went and saw the movie Easy Rider a week later. They were in love and got married. <laughs> my mom said, where do you want to live? And my dad said, uh, San Francisco. They moved here. Um, she left him um, for a short period of time for another woman. They broke up. Um, we lived in Noe Valley. My mom still lives there. They bought the house for $21,000. Um, it was a working class neighborhood, Noe Valley. Um, my dad moved in with one of his girlfriends. Um, my parents broke up. We moved to Hawaii for a short period of time, and we lived on welfare for three years. Where in um, Hawaii? Uh, Waikiki. Nice. Yeah, me and Obama. <laughs> no, I remember. I remember um, getting out of preschool every day and going to the beach. And um, a couple years ago, my mom turned 70, and so I took her back to Hawaii, and we rented a convertible Mustang and I took her to Enos Lane which is this little dead-end street and we went and looked at the house that we lived in on welfare and it was like totally still there and totally still shitty yeah. in a great way yeah yeah it was good so um my parents split up my dad moved in with assorted single men who also were separated from their wives who had kids. So we lived with um, Gypsy and Peter Snyder, and Gypsy was in Pickle Family Circus. And so in the summers, we would tour with the circus. And that was over on Bernal Heights on Anderson Street. And then my mother's boyfriend was Chet Helms, who was a 60s music promoter. Chet started the Avalon Ballroom and had gone to high school with Janis Joplin and brought her to San Francisco. And, um, and so they had this crazy relationship of love and hate for like a thousand years, um, which is a whole other story, right? Mm -hmm. And then at some point, my dad was, um, was, was driving around and saw the houseboat community. And at the time, it was... Um, it was a bunch of very old people. Um, they had, they had, they had, what did they had done? So the China Basin building used to have docks 
and banana boats would come in. And so on, on the, I guess it's the south side of the creek, there was a dock that ran all along the shore. And at some point, they cut the dock off, flipped it in the water, and then put boats in. And they were kind of pirate boats. And the sort of our urban legend is this woman, Ruth Huffaker, um, at some point got some politician to like write on a bar napkin that, that we were allowed to stay here. As all good deals do, they <laughs> started at a bar on a napkin. Yeah, and so, you know, in when I was when I was 6 and 7, you know, there was junkies in the parking lot, you know, the people would bring their johns down. Um it was abandoned train yards. Um we had BB guns, we ran with jackrabbits, like we had the full run of the place. And then our neighbors were like this weird cadre of coots. Um like slim was like always 90 years old. <laughs> he was always 90 years old um, in my mind. And he had taken the Wild Bill West show to China in 1910. And he, <laughs> and he was nuts. Um, he was nuts. He, um, he had a microwave with no door on it that he would run in his house. I don't even know if that's, I mean, I think that was so long ago that they probably now have safeties that prevent microwaves from running. Yeah. And then um, he, he'd go on his boat and he'd have like a, a grill, uh, like a hot plate. And he would always had a thing of chili going in a linseed oil can <laughs> on the hot plate. And he'd tell you, that the secret to good chili was snuff. Oh my God. <laughs> and he wouldn't drink, he wouldn't drink cold beer. And if you gave him a beer, he would take it and he would go heat it up and make it warm. Interesting. And then, and he had tons of cats and he had like a, like a Cadillac in the parking lot that one day he just got like a can of blue paint and like painted the whole thing blue. And then there was Irv and Irv had never been known to bathe. <laughs> And he was just, I mean, he looks like you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, he just had like a lot of like open sores on his forehead. And he looked like kind of a demented elf. <laughs> and we would have these big community parties. And he would go to all like the dented can warehouses and buy all his food there. Mm -hmm. And if you turned your back on him, he'd sneak jalapenos in everybody else's oh. dishes. <laughs> So prankster. <laughs> yeah, and it wasn't like it wasn't like malicious. It was like truly in his spirit. With it, that's what he thought. Like everything needed. Yeah. And you had to keep your eye on him. Um, and he 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 had um, a cat with three legs, and a duck with a broken wing, and a dog that was deaf. And the three of them lived in this house with Irv with no bathroom. And they, you'd see them on the dock, and they would, like, groom each other, the three animals, in, like, this perfect, like, land of the broken toys. Like, they had found each other. <laughs> would, would Irv be part of that, grooming? Oh, Irv, <laughs> you yeah, said three no, and, like, No, four. maybe they were compensating for his lack of grooming. Right. Um, and then, like, he had this, like, really weird way of problem solving. So he, his electricity somehow didn't work or got cut off. And so he started bringing um, batteries, like car batteries, into the house to power things. And when his boat finally sank, it sank so fast because the entire first floor was like walking from battery to battery, which he eventually just put sheets of plywood on top. And he would, he would talk about the government and how the government was crime made legal. And he would call 911 multiple times a day. They'd come down and like be like, he's got to, he's got to stop. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so these are the kids, the people that I grew up with. What era was like? What years? Eighties. So I'm I'm forty six, seven ish, and I was seven years old, so it was forty years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's like the early late I late seventies. I can't do math. That's okay. Um, um, Just trying to kind of set a, a yeah, timeline. Like early eighties. What did you think? I mean, you you had a sounds like an adventurous life even before then. What did you think about? Oh, dad's moving us into a boat. The beauty of was, children is like, like they don't. I mean, I don't know. It <laughs> like, wasn't a thing. It wasn't a thing. It yeah, was, there's no choice in it. Right. Yeah, and there was always strange people around. Mm -hmm. Like strange people do not bother me at all. Mm -hmm. Um. 
Yeah, and they were just strange. Like, like one night, I, I was like my late teens, and I'm coming home, and I stop at the Petro Safeway, and there's this woman, and she's talking, and she goes, oh, look at that poor man over there. He's in a wheelchair. He's waiting for a taxi forever. He is just the sweetest old man. And so it was Bob Palm. And Bob Palm was the most deviant, deviant mm -hmm. homosexual I ever knew. <laughs> he, um, he, again, one of those people who in my childhood was in his 90s for like 20 years. He is a, was a prolific tattoo artist in the army. And his body was covered with tattoos that were ageless, had not aged. And he had a full human face tattooed on his groin with his mouth around his cock. Oh my God. And he, um, <laughs> so there was nothing sweet about Bob Paul. You said devious. <laughs> there was nothing sweet about him at all. <laughs> and he, you know, he had his boys that would always live with him. And I think they did lots of pills and they were like, they were hilarious. Mm. They were hilarious. Um, yeah, these were the people that we grew up with. Yes, yeah, so we moved down here. Um, we moved down here. We've lived here for 40 years. Um... In this very houseboat. We're in our third houseboat. <clears throat> okay. We're in our third houseboat. Our first houseboat was a landing craft. Mm -hmm. And what my dad did is he cut the top off, and then we built one room. And then we had a, me and my brother had a room above, and we had, you had to climb onto the hot water heater and go into a hole in the ceiling. And it was a, a eight, by, eight by eight by four foot high plywood box with a blue tarp on it. And I had one side and my brother had another side and there was just like a pine shelf with no back in between. Um, and it was so cold. <laughs> and I, like, my parents weren't neglectful. It just never occurred to, like it would never occur to me to ask for something and mm -hmm. it would never occur to them to consider something. Mm -hmm. And it was um, um, like, I remember once we discovered that my brother had decided the best way to dress was to wear six pairs of pants at a time and every day he would take a layer off or maybe every day he would add, probably add a layer because it was so cold on the boat. Mm -hmm. And back then, I mean, like the, the community you see now is nothing like it was. Like we had these old docks that were just flipped over, tarred and planked. And so my dad and I, when we walked down the dock, we couldn't walk together because they would sink. And um, um, this is totally a gross story, but fabulous. Um, so my brother and I would make money because when rats die, they sink to the bottom of the creek and their stomachs bloat and they float up. And if there's no pass through between the dock and the boats, um, they get stuck. And so you have to see this bloated rat in the water right outside. So we would go from house to house like every month or so with a nail in a two by four. And we would pop people's rats for a dollar. <laughs> and it was like, it was totally hilarious. Um, Your version of a lemonade stand, yeah, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> That's awesome. yeah. And, you know, the creek, you know, it's so funny because all these fancy people are moving in here. And so often they'll they'll go, what's that building at the end of the creek? And it's like, you just bought a $4 million studio apartment and you didn't go, oh, let me look and see what, that I live next to a sewage transfer plant. <laughs> like you didn't, you didn't think or, or it smells mm -hmm. like it smells. So all of the sewer south of market feeds into the transfer plant at the end of the creek and then it gets pumped to, gets pumped to Bayview. Mm -hmm. And so at the creek, at the edge of the creek, are three overflow valves. So when so much water hits the system, the worst is the first rain because all the sewer stuff has collected. Right? And it just hasn't been flushed out in the same way. And so they dump raw sewage into the creek. Mm -hmm. And so when I was little, we used to call it Shit Creek, the Rat and Rubber. And I probably should have t-shirts made. Yeah, you should. Um, I should have t-shirts made. Talk to um, Mike at Babylon Burning. I know. I think it would be. Some of my neighbors are so in denial about it. Like, they're not proud of their pa our past like I am. Um, so I would get flack, which might be the reason to do it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, when Olivia was born, people were like, are you going to immunize her? It was like the big immunization thing. And I'm like... I live in a fucking open sewer. I'm gonna, That's I'm gonna give her mean. every shot. Like, let's give her 
twice as many shots, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> um, so that was our first boat. Um, my dad ran um, Intersection for the Arts oh. in North Beach. And so he always ran art facilities. And my mother worked at Rainbow Grocery. Mm. She was on welfare and went from welfare to work at Rainbow Grocery. What are their names? Um, uh, Jack Davis, the good Jack Davis, not the bad Jack Davis. <laughs> and uh, that's another story. <laughs> and then Judy Davis. Um, and so my mom worked at Rainbow Grocery when it was on, it was on 17th Street. It was on 6th. It was on 17th Street first, and it was a tiny corner store um, across from the Kilowatt. And everybody who worked there was, like, these amazing people. Like, I remember being, like, in the third grade and going to work with my mom and, like, Eartha. Like, Eartha was this Egyptian-looking trans man to woman, and she just, she, she, she was my idol, Like, she was my idol. And then her boyfriend, Spud, who was, like, the Rastafarian hippie guy. And, I mean, maybe they were boyfriend-girlfriend. But in my mind, they're they're, they're connected to each other. And I was just so in love with Eartha. Like, she was, like, my idol. Mm -hmm. Um, And then my dad ran Intersection for the Arts in North Beach. So we spent a lot of time in North Beach. And then um, after Intersection, he stopped working in arts organizations for about a half a second and then moved to SoMarts. Mm -hmm. And at the time, SoMarts, the South American Cultural Center, um, provided all the staging and bleachers and infrastructure for the city street fairs. So Carnival, Cinco de Mayo, um, the Chinese New Year Parade. And so my dad always had bleachers. And so as a kid, we would go at four in the morning and we would assemble bleachers. Okay. (laughs) And then as soon as the parade is over, we would take them apart. Um, Actually, I have a a set of the bleachers outside that I, that they, the the, the program has been disbanded. And so they gave me my dad's bleachers. I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do with them. Yeah. Um, So my dad became the executive director of SoMarts. And what's kind of interesting about him is he didn't have an art opinion. Like a lot of people who run arts institutions consider themselves curators and sort of um, sort of cultivators of art. Where mm-hmm. my dad universally, if you walked in the front door and you wanted to do something, he was in favor of helping you do it. And so... More democratic. Yeah, yeah. And also like it doesn't have like like this pretension to it it's like it was a real community theater um so like joseph domingo who is like the godfather of like trans filipino fashion you know he like dad told me one story where so it's a multi big building with multiple things going on and in the back was a drag kings show Hmm. and drag kings are um dykes who dress in male um sort of work clothes and maybe I'm fucking that up all because I'm totally capable of not being culturally sensitive or appropriate. <laughs> it's okay. Um, but so it was a photography show of drag kings. And they came into my dad's office and they were furious at him because Joseph Domingo had done a beauty fashion pageant the night before. And the entire pageant is supported by these Filipino grandmothers mm. who make lumpia and food. Mm-hmm. But the way Joseph and the whole thing presented is like a normal sort of pa- female pageant fashion show. And dad was like, those are trans men. And the drag kings hadn't really appreciated that mm. cultural sensitivity mm-hmm. Like they just had missed, they had missed the plot in that. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of a perfect example of of San Francisco. And if you look at all the cultural centers that exist in San Francisco, there's multiple. Um, There's the Bayview Opera House. There's the African American Art and Cultural Complex. There's SoMarts. There's the Mission Cultural Center. There's a couple of virtual centers. There's the um, Native American Cultural Center. And then the Queer Cultural Center didn't have a home until the building was built. Mm-hmm. And each one of those has sort of a demographic or sort of a cent- an organizing theme to it, even mm-hmm. though they're they're serving everybody in their community. And SoMarts was probably one of the ones that was, was sort of reflecting of what's really going on in More the umbrella. South of Market. Mm-hmm. I mean, because that's, I mean, the South of Market... Even before the mission was where warehouse artists like Mark Pauline and Survival Research Laboratories had their first shows. Um, when Burning Man started, 
ev- they would erect the man in the back of the building. My dad was one of the first supporters of Burning Man. Um, and all these sort of warehouse punk groups, um, Naughty Santas, um, um, you know, all these arts groups felt like that was their home. Mm-hmm. So that was sort of a second, you know, a second place that I grew up. So, yeah, so my mom and my dad sort of lived in these sort of different art worlds. My mom with her boyfriend, who was like this depressed music promoter. You know? Chet. <laughs> Chet. Yes. And, you know, Chet was like, Chet, the, the story of Chet is um, Chet rented a room at, at the Avalon Ballroom. He right. rented it to live. <laughs> and all these, and he would have parties. And so many people would come that they started charging money. That is like how it all started. Mm -hmm. And then Bill Graham came and said, wow, interesting, and started to do it. And they both started charging money. Only Bill Graham made money at it and Chet didn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that's sort of like, you know, like Bill woke up, woke up at six in the morning and went to work and Chet woke up at noon. (laughs) Right. Um, (laughs) They, they, that there was like lifestyle versus business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, those were the different tracks that we were living in. And, you know, down here, um, we were sort of living in this, um, you know, this boat. And one night the boat sinks. While you were on it? Uh, no, I was living in my mom's house in Noe Valley. Um, or I was staying at my mom's house in Noe Valley. And I think he was actually growing pot in the upstairs. So as it was sinking, all these people came to help. And he was like, nothing to see here. Let's just kind of let it sink. And then we'll come back tomorrow and raise it. Um, so, but I mean, not like growing like pot, like he had three plants. Mm-hmm. But that was then. Mm-hmm. You know, then that was like dangerous. Yeah. Like Big my deal. mom, when she was on welfare, she always grew pot in our backyard. And I remember what she would do is she would hang plastic tomatoes on her pot plants. Mm. And as, cause, cause she was so afraid, cause that was like camp and people and helicopters, totally. they would take away your kids in your house if mm-hmm. you got caught. So she dressed up her pot plants as yeah, tomatoes. Yeah. But one year she made 10, plant $10,000 growing pot in her backyard. And, and she was on welfare and she was raising two kids. And she told her Republican father in San Marino what Ooh. she had done. And the and the business side of the Republican like really fucking appreciated oh, it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the public hypocrisy. Yeah. And then private were like, go kid. Yeah. So, you know, we're make living. Make that money. <laughs> make the money. So we're living on this boat, um, and I'm I'm in high school now. I'm in high school now, so I'm drinking more forty ounces. Mm-hmm. I'm being in the city. It's hard to get down here. It's what dangerous. high school did you go to? I went to McAteer. Mm-hmm. Um, I went to Buena Vista, kind of right when it was becoming a Spanish immersion, and then I um, went to St. Paul's for half a second, and then I went to McAteer School of the Arts. Um, and so I'm partying. I'm panhandling for 40 ounces on 24th and, and Mission. I'm going to shows at the farm. Um, my dad's on the board of directors at the farm. I went to Buena Vista, which is across from Portrayal de la Sol. Mm-hmm. My dad's best friends ran the farm. Um, there was a, um, a junkyard in between the two. And so my dad and Jack Wickert and Bonnie Shrek, they all got together and convinced the city to buy that abandoned parking lot and build that park. And um, it's funny, years later I was doing, um, I was with a police officer and they were talking about how incredibly hard that park is because it has all these rolling hills, which makes it incredibly difficult to police and monitor it. Mm -hmm. And I specifically remember the meeting where my dad and his friends were like, all these parks are flat. Like these parks need to be like they need we need you know San Francisco's like, not flat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um and so the farm, just to divert a little bit, the farm so Bonnie had this idea of this urban farm. And she was really an artist and Jack Wickert was this scrappy taxi driver who grew up in the projects in Petro Hill. And they started this thing, the farm, and they had animals in the basement and um she had this vision of animals and theater transforming the lives of children and so we would we would go um, we would go there during school and then years later the farm became harder and harder to sustain as an arts facility and so they started doing punk shows right when I came into like 13 14 15 Mm -hmm. so we would go see drunk engine and we would go see touch me hooker and and we would panhandle on 24th street 
oh my god i need to get back to Walnut Creek and I don't have any money like help me out and then you'd walk down 24th Street you'd find a, a you'd find a, a homeless person who would buy you a 40 ounce and they would come out with a styrofoam cup on the top of the 40 and you would give them the first drink <laughs> and then and then you would then you would go down to um the farm and you would sit and drink your 40 ounces with the cholos at the at the chess table in the park and then you would go see the show and um, it was great it was a great childhood that was houseboat resident sarah davis join us again thursday when sarah will take us through the building of her current houseboat and talk about the san francisco houseboat community as it exists today music for the podcast is by otis mcdonald Film photography is by Michelle Kilfeather. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay up to date on everything we do. All of our past episodes are up on our website, storiedsf.com, and wherever you listen to podcasts. If that happens to be Apple Podcasts and you have a minute to spare, please rate and review the show for us. Send comments or suggestions to storiedsf at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>